Hey, you looking for a way to unschool, unlearn, and unplug? You're on the right frequency then. Holistic wellness, natural law, spiritual teachings, esoteric science, suppressed history, survivalism for the road ahead, and a return to what makes humans human. Unhinged, unrestrained, uncensored. If you're weak of mind or of heart, this is not for you. Because this is Detox. Hey yo, we're from the kingdom of Ohio. You are listening to Detox, where we're burrowing deep down into those cells and cleansing you from all your wicked ways. I am Ryan Thomas. Welcome to the D program. In this episode, I am chatting with Clyde DeCarl, one of the most magical medical mediums in the game today. He's one of the world's most respected and leading health researchers with nearly four decades of experience under his belt, ranging from nutritional science and supplementation to frequency medicine and the esoterics of electrical voltage. His talks, retreats, broadcasts, videos, and personal consultations have helped tens of thousands of folks worldwide, and his secret health club is one of the most comprehensive resources in the health and wellness field that I've had the pleasure of perusing. Honestly, if I had to describe Clive in another way, I'd say he's the cool, suave, older English gentleman sitting in the corner of the pub that everyone gathers around after they've had a few pints because they know he's seen some shit and they gotta get his story. It's kind of like sitting across from James Bond at a poker table, but instead of some high-tech wristwatch, he's got a Tesla coil. Hyperbole? You be the judge. We're going to cover off on a lot of Clive's work with vitamins and minerals and how to cleanse ourselves at a cellular level in the first hour. And in the second hour, we're going to get into frequency, electricity, Tesla technology, and maybe even touch on your body's own version of alchemical medicine. Clive DeCarl is in the house, my house, your house, our house, and ready to deliver a straight up nasty dose of sonically transmitted discourse. So sit back, relax, and let the UK's secret health agent seduce you with his stealth health weaponry. Enjoy. Clive DeCaro, welcome to what I call the D program. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Ryan. Great pleasure to be with you. Oh, no, the pleasure's all mine, believe me. I've been following your work for a long time now. Much respect to you and what you're doing and the information that you so kindly share with people. And I hope we can share a lot of good info here today. I have a lot of things I want to touch on with you, so the next couple hours will probably feel like a whirlwind. But before we get to all that, I know that the road to better health for you personally has been a long and winding one, and I'd like to start there. Uh, as you say on your website, you were at the peak of success in your field at the ripe young age of 32, and then found yourself, honestly, where so many others have found themselves at the mercy of the rather incompetent pharma industrial complex and things did not turn out as you anticipated and this is where your life forked in a different direction onto a different path tell us a little bit about where you were and what you overcame to get to where you are today so i was running an ophthalmic optics company we were making contact lenses and doing stuff like that and so i was incredibly embarrassed because at a about 31, I had these spots on my face like a teenager. And what I should have done is stopped eating Mars bars for lunch, you know, and to behave myself. But instead of that, I don't know what came over me because I, I never liked doctors, but I went to a doctor and said, what should I do? And he said, oh, one antibiotic, that'll fix the whole thing. I took one antibiotic and within a few couple of weeks or so, stuff was going wrong with my eyesight. And then I started aching all over and I got so arthritic that after a while I realized I could no longer do stairs. And then I realized I couldn't drive my car anymore. And one morning I woke up and I'm stranded in bed. I don't have the strength anymore. I'm in too much pain to get out of bed. I can't do it. So they put me in hospital. I'm in hospital for weeks and weeks and weeks and they can't figure out what's wrong with me. I suggest, or could it be the antibiotic? Oh, no, 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 no. You know, that's heresy to suggest such a thing. And anyway, while I was really too weak to even get dressed, I could turn the pages on a book. And after about three or four weeks, I realized what had happened to me, the damage that the antibiotic had done. And I realized I could fix it myself. 
So I got wheeled out in a wheelchair and I went to seek help from an expert and he explained to me that as I discovered I was low on vitamins and minerals and so on, so I started taking lots of vitamins and minerals and changed my diet a little bit and stopped eating the Mars bars for lunch. Oh, by that time I'd also become type 1 diabetic as well, which didn't help. Anyway, a year and a bit later, all the arthritis disappears completely. And I mean, I got to the stage that most people don't get to with arthritis, where I couldn't even get dressed. It all disappeared. 35 years ago, all my arthritis disappeared. Now, the doctors aren't taught that arthritis can be cured. It's just not part of their curriculum. They don't do nutrition. I've spoken to doctors in the States. I said, how many months, weeks do you spend studying nutrition during the five years at medical school? Uh, four hours in five years was the, the common answer. Four hours nutrition. And most of what they're taught is wrong. So we are self-repairing, and that's the route that I took. You know, I was young. Why can't I self-repair? Well, why can't people self-repair? Well, there are only three reasons why people get ill. That's physical damage. You, know, you get hit by a truck or something, well, you're a bit ill. There's toxic poisoning, and we're all toxically poisoned, all of us. Then the final one is nutrient deficiency. And again, we're all nutrient deficient one way or another. So my theory was and is, if you can get the toxins out, put the nutrients in and fix the physical damage as much as you can, well, by default, you should be well doesn't matter what age you are, we should, if you like, be healthy until the day we die. We go to sleep one night and we don't wake up in the morning. But obviously, as it was we all observe, that's not the case. Yeah, it's really not. And I know that you don't mention stress in that explanation of what causes sickness in the body. Uh, that's a toxic poison. Right. I was just going to say, like, you have a different view on that. I've heard a lot of other, you know, health practitioners and gurus talk about stress as being the primary cause. But I think when you really get down, you drill down into it, that stress is just another poison that we could, I guess, expel from our bodies or at least learn how to work better with it. Because it, it's always a part of our, our day to day life. Right. Well, you know, toxins have been thrown at us from a very, very early age at school. We might have some the teacher might have said, you're stupid. That That's an emotional toxin. In, you know, so the world is throwing toxins at us in every way, shape, or form. And I totally agree, stress is number one, actually, which is a super interesting subject because the big answer to stress is magnesium, and the big answer to arthritis is magnesium. I'm sure we'll get on to talking more about magnesium, but the rest of my story is that after I recovered. My dad's best friend got cancer for the second time and was told he was going to die. And given, you know, a day in the calendar. By the way, how do they know to say you've got three months to live or you've got six months to live? How they know that is because what they intend to do is to give you this chemotherapy drug or that chemotherapy drug, and nobody survives longer than six months on that chemotherapy drug. That's why they know, you know, it's on the basis that, well, either it'll kill the cancer or it'll kill you, and we're hoping it's the cancer. But, of course, the cure for cancer never is chemotherapy. I saw my grandfather, who I was really close with five or six years ago, die from what they called cancer. I called it toxic poisoning from the chemo and the radiation, of course. You know, that's what kills people when they get into these advanced ages and these quote unquote treatments. So, and you mentioned magnesium. Yeah, I got a, I got plenty of notes on magnesium that we'll get to in a moment. But I also know that you were an organic farmer for about 10 years. Why would you ever leave that life? Well, a number of reasons, mainly to do with ex-wives or one ex-wife. Fair enough. <laughs> Talk about stress as a toxin, right? <laughs> Anyways, okay. So full disclosure, that is something that I'm I'm actually trying to work toward in my life. So I was just curious why you would leave that life because from where I stand now, you know, and I'm I just turned 38. So the way forward for me looks the more practical way forward looks like having land, learning how to to live that organic farming lifestyle. Well, while I would love to have the farm right now, actually it's a full-time job. Mm. And I've got a different full-time job right now. I'm relying on other people to grow, grow the biodynamic, organic stuff for me. And I'm very lucky that where I live, I can get that. I can get just brilliant, brilliant, real food. 
Fair enough, for sure. Yeah, I also can do that. And I'm very grateful as things, you know, change over the the next several years with supply chains and whatnot. So uh, you mentioned the body was self-repairing, it's self-healing, it's self-regulating. I think that's a good way to frame up our entire chat here. It's always working back toward homeostasis. It just needs the right tools to regenerate proper cellular function because we've all been guilty of, and I'm going to call it self-harm because we've literally been poisoning ourselves for a long time and allowing ourselves to be poisoned as well. But we're all guilty of that because I just think we don't know any better. There's a lack of education there. There's a lack of, uh, let's call it medico-scientific literacy that stems from that lack of education because the average human just doesn't know how their body works. They don't comprehend the processes and how to best support themselves. So as we work our way through the chat here, Clive, I want to be sure that we explain as much as we can about the science behind what it is we're talking about. Let's get as deep and as dense as we can, because I know when I started down this path, I didn't want my naturopath to just tell me I needed more magnesium, for example. I wanted to know why. I wanted to know what magnesium was doing in my body, what roles and responsibilities it has, how to identify when I'm lacking it, how much to take, when to take it, so that I can doctor myself. Does that sound good? Well, absolutely. And what we're going to be talking about, they should have taught at school. Every 16-year-old could easily, in a day, have a really great understanding of magnesium in one day. And I hope that I can impart that in like 10 minutes or 15 minutes here, because it's not a difficult science, and it could save lives like nobody's business. I forgot to finish the story about my dad's best friend. He gets cancer for the second time. He's given 12 weeks left to live, and... He says to me, look, uh, they took out my kidney last time. I've only got one kidney left, so I'm not going to let them take out another one. So he looks in the phone book for a very famous person at that point that was Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling, the only man to win as an individual the Nobel Prize twice. And he rings him, and he must have been probably 90 at this point, and the man answers the telephone. He says, look, I've got for the second time. What do I do? Linus Pauling Pauling tells him to take 35 grams of vitamin C every day in divided doses. He takes 35 grams of vitamin C in divided doses, and when he does die, it's 20 years later, and it wasn't from cancer. So it's super important to understand that even though most people are told cancer is the death sentence, doesn't mean so. Uh, Did you know that men with prostate cancer live one year longer on average than men without prostate cancer. Did you know that most prostate cancer can take between 10 and 15 years to kill you? But if a doctor diagnoses it, they might want to operate right away. Now, is that sensible? So let's say that somebody gets diagnosed at 70. So they're probably not going to die of it till 85, but they may well die of the surgery at 71. And people assume that all cancers are the same. They all have the same speed or whatever. But of course, it was only about maybe four years ago when the medical profession here in England changed the definition of several cancers to lesions. That yes, they've been giving chemotherapy and making a lot of money and operations for these cancers forever, but now they've changed their minds. They got caught out. They weren't cancers, not at all then people assume that the tests for cancers are any good and accurate. Yeah, I've actually heard that about a lot of skin cancers or what they call skin cancer. There's a lot of of false diagnoses or I guess mislabeling of some of these skin conditions that people call cancerous that aren't actually cancerous. I'm thinking of things like basal cell carcinoma, not actually a cancer from what I've learned about it. So yeah, it's interesting how they frame this stuff up really just to scare you into accepting their solution to the problem, which obviously costs you thousands of dollars and a lot of your time and ultimately your entire health and lifespan. So important to understand too, Clive, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but cancer is just a normal biological process. I mean, it happens to everybody. Like I have cancer in my body right now, just because that's how cells operate, right? And as long as my immune system isn't overwhelmed by the amount of cancerous cells, you know, if it's doing its job properly, like I won't see any of those symptoms, right? Well, yes. I mean, everybody's got cancer and it's just a natural cycle that uh, comes and goes, you know, an autopsy. You know, they can see that several cancers have come and gone because we self-repair. The danger is getting tested. You know, you get tested 
for something, what if it was one of those times where it never was going to bother you? you know, why do they test? They're looking, looking for customers. And so I, I wouldn't want to be tested. I wouldn't want to be diagnosed. I mean, look, look at the derivation of the word. And I'm not being entirely serious here, right? Gnosis, diagnose. Gnosis from the Greek is to know. Agnosis, diagnosis, it, agnosis is not to know. Diagnosis is two people not knowing. <laughs> right. Language is important. So I think knowing those root words is actually, it does bring new meaning to some of these words that we take for granted every day. We'll look at words like pharmacy, pharmaceutical from the Greek uh, meaning poison. Mm -hmm. Pharmakia, yeah, right. People who study for five years to be able to poison people legally. It's like 007, you know, licensed to kill, literally. Is. <laughs> yeah. So I mentioned magnesium. We mentioned magnesium. Let's start there as we're going to talk, you know, a little bit about cellular medicine here. I know you're quite knowledgeable about magnesium. It's a crucial mineral that a lot of people are probably lacking. What role does magnesium play in our cellular structure here? And how can we identify if we need more of it? Okay. I can simplify that. Everybody needs more of it because we're all hyper stressed in the whole world right now. Uh, I suspect the Zen Buddhist monks who've been meditating for the last 20 years are probably a bit stressed as well. And how the body copes with stress is by using up your magnesium reserves. So for a really acute example, let's look at all these football players who are dropping down dead, right? What's happening to them? They're having heart attacks. What's happening to children? That A lot of people, after being needled, are having heart issues, right? Now... What would cause all those things? The deficiency in magnesium would cause all those, all those issues because magnesium is the mineral that allows relaxation. So if you're stressed and you burned up all your magnesium or you've had a stressful football game where you've sweated and you sweat out the magnesium, you die. You have a heart attack because the heart beats and it's magnesium that allows it to relax. So Let's say you see somebody in the desert and they're dead, right? We would assume, we're led to assume, that they must have died of dehydration. But they wouldn't have done. They wouldn't have died. They would have died because they sweated out all the magnesium. They have a heart attack, drop down dead. And we're seeing people drop over. Now, I mean, obviously, there may be all sorts of poison, poisons that they had inside them. But it strikes me that whatever it is that they're being needled with, that that is possibly causing a huge magnesium deficiency. And that it might be that if somebody was determined to be needled, that they should consider maybe supplementing with magnesium to protect their heart. Obviously, nobody should consider a procedure at all. I mean, you know, doctors tried to kill me. I would, If I'd listened to the doctors, I would have been dead 30 years ago. So, you know... If I lose my health, or if you lose your health, you want to go to somebody who's an expert in health, not some doctor who's done four hours. What are some of the symptoms then of just in a normal person, you know, whether they're, whether they've taken any experimental procedures recently or not, what would be some of the symptoms that we would be able to identify that would show us a magnesium deficiency on some level? Absolutely. Well, I'll run through a number of them, and somebody only needs to have one of them to have a magnesium deficiency. You don't need the whole set. Hiccups, twitches around the eyes, menstrual cramps, any type of cramp, muscle cramp if you wake up and stretch, you know, the backs of your legs or your feet, constipation, heart issues like heart arrhythmia, your heart suddenly races for no reason or it's beating out of rhythm. Uh, it could be Panic attacks, anxiety, could be headaches, migraines, could be sleep issues, could be depression, suicidal thoughts, the inability to relax. Anybody with constipation needs to realize they're going to be low on magnesium. Now, let's say that you're getting cramps. Now, uh, your muscle cramp. What if you got a muscle cramp in your heart muscle? That would be a heart attack. So I say you don't have to have any more than one of those symptoms. And how many people in the world or in North America right now are low on magnesium? Really, I suggest probably 
Yeah, I heard somewhere recently that you need 40 milligrams of magnesium to process every gram of sugar that you consume. And so I got curious and I did some research and I found that the average Christmas cookie, which some people may be snacking on this time of year, has about 16 grams of sugar in it. And so by my calculation there, you would need 640 milligrams of magnesium just to process that one cookie. And so I pulled out my supplement, my magnesium supplement, and the one that I have is 100 milligram capsules. And so I would need to take 6.4 of those just to process that one cookie. And that's not, you know, taking into account what else I'm eating. If I'm eating one cookie, I'm probably eating other foods containing sugar that need process as well. So yeah, the recommended daily allowance is just, or allowance, it makes it sound like we need permission, right? Or we we're only getting so many grams of magnesium from our parents, you know, but it just, yeah, it just goes to show that the recommended guidelines there are not in alignment with how people actually eat. And so everybody is extremely malnourished in that sense. So let me try and explain it. The RDA, the recommended daily allowance, is the amount that was calculated in World War II to stop the soldiers just dropping down dead of a heart attack, whatever it is. And so for women in America, it's 380 milligrams is the RDA, the absolute minimum to stop you dropping down dead and 400 milligrams for a man. Now, that's not the therapeutic dose, right? That's not the dose that's good for you. That's just the absolute bare minimum. So with your 100 milligram capsules, you'd need four of those to get to the you're not going to die stage. But to get to a level where somebody, let's say, is incredibly anxious, and they want to be calm, they, they've got rheumatoid arthritis and they want to stop the joint pain. Magnesium is incredible for stopping joint pain, ending arthritis. Uh, you may have to do with some other things as well, but magnesium is the big one. So I recommend these days, assuming they've got a good version with the right ingredients in, I recommend that many people who are full-grown adults consider taking 12 magnesium capsules a day for a while, for a few days or a few weeks. I've had people suicidally depressed, 24 magnesium capsules later, two days later, not suicidal anymore. People haven't slept through the night. I mean, with Crow, right? Crow had a trigger finger. His, his sister just had an operation to have it done. He was booked to have an operation. I'm on his show. He tells me about the trigger finger. I've already sent him some vitamin C and magnesium. He takes the amount that I suggest. And on the show, with about one hour in, his finger straightens. That's how quickly and how powerful magnesium of the right type is. But the right type is super critical. Now, let's say somebody's got a, some magnesium in front of them and they look at the strength. It might say, not that there's 100 milligrams of magnesium in it, but it might say there's 650 milligrams in each capsule, which would be true. But the point is that the 100 milligrams you mentioned would have been probably the elemental magnesium. So you've got magnesium salts, you know, magnesium glycinate or citrate or whatever it is. And so the elemental magnesium is of, of that combination of the, say, citrate and magnesium. How much is citrate and how much is actually magnesium? And generally speaking, in one capsule, you get about, about 100 milligrams of magnesium in each one. So... Taking 12 is, let's say, three times the RDA. The 12 sounds frightening to people, but it's not when you understand that it's not very much. Physically, in bulk, you need quite a lot of magnesium. Same with vitamin C and many others. It's all about the dose. But the big thing about magnesium, if somebody goes to the big box store and they buy the big one on the shelf that it's the price they want, and it says magnesium in big letters, you can bet money that when you look at the supplement facts on the back, it's going to say magnesium oxide. Now, magnesium oxide is the really cheap stuff. So if the supplement company doesn't care about you, they will sell you magnesium oxide. They'll sell it cheap and it won't work. And people will hear things like, you should try magnesium for your arthritis. They say, oh, I tried it. It didn't work. That's because they were deliberately sold a type that won't work, so that they think they've tried it but haven't. You know, I reckon 95% of the health supplement industry is now run by the bad, bad guys. They've taken the industry over. 
what if it's magnesium oxide and it's it's mixed with some of these other salts, you know? Got magnesium oxide in it at all, avoid it. The problem with magnesium oxide is the amount of elemental magnesium in magnesium oxide is really tiny, but the oxide part of it will put you in the bathroom right away. If you want to get diarrhea, take magnesium oxide. If you don't, then avoid it, because before you get any decent amount of magnesium in you, you're shitting it all out the other end, you know? I don't think minerals get as much love or attention as vitamins do when you're talking about supplementation and what people actually need for proper cellular function. But I want to touch on a threesome here that, again, most people probably need much more of. I'm talking about zinc, iodine, and selenium. And zinc is probably the one that does get the most attention of those three, especially this time of year. It's always on the cold and flu treatment list. But iodine and selenium are, to me anyway, often overlooked. And deficiencies in these two specifically can really create some internal havoc, right? Well, you're 100% right. I mean, let's just touch very briefly on zinc. If you look at your fingernails and you see white dots, or on your kids, there are white dots on their fingernails, that's a pretty sure sign of a zinc deficiency. And there are loads of foods that are rich in zinc. And I would suggest that anybody who wants to take zinc as a supplement could first just look at the foods that are rich in it, Pumpkin seeds. There, there are all sorts of foods that you might like the sound of. Oysters, absolutely full of zinc and selenium. But if you've got copper pipes in your house, you know, the plumbing is copper pipes, copper and uh, zinc go together. So if you've got too much copper because of the copper coming off in the copper pipes, you might be low on zinc and want to take some. Zinc is clearly one of the big keys so that you don't get colds or flus or anything catchy, if indeed things are catchy. But that's all of the story. But there's no, no question that you do a few things, vitamin D, zinc, vitamin C, magnesium, iodine, maybe selenium, probably you're now 95% resistant to anything, if not 100%. I mean, I haven't had a sniffle or a cold for 15 years because I figured out being in, in England, I was low on vitamin D in winter. That was the big one that cracked it for me. So selenium and iodine. Iodine, the symptoms of iodine deficiency are really easy to spot. Anybody who's got a thyroid problem, iodine deficiency Anybody who's got a temperature problem, cold hands and feet, wearing socks in bed, way too hot, menopausal women getting hot flushes, breast cancer, hormonal issues, dry skin, forgetfulness, walking in a room and forgetting why you walked in, brain fog. Those are some of the common symptoms of iodine deficiency. And in the United States, tests uh, show that over 96% of everybody is low on iodine. I mean, 96% plus, and that's the work of Dr. Brownstein, who wrote the book, made the documentary, Iodine, Why You Need It, Why You Can't Live Without It. Brilliant book, video. So everybody's low on iodine. How quickly can you get a positive benefit? Well, like magnesium, you get a positive benefit on the first day, with iodine, it can take a little bit longer. And as with everything, the doctors are taught iodine all wrong. Now, 150 years ago, when the type of iodine that I recommend, which is called Lugol's iodine, was invented by Professor Lugol, if you went to the doctor and they didn't know what was wrong with you, they were mystified, what would they do as the very first thing they give you iodine? because iodine balances temperature. There are many cases when you want a high temperature to burn off the fever. High temperatures are fine. If you are panicking about a, a child having a high temperature, you could put them in a lukewarm bath and they'll rapidly cool down. Not too cold, just warm, but not hot. With temperature, a high temperature is very important. So. Most people, if they take their temperature, they'll find they're low. Almost everybody in the United States 
is running a temperature one degree under what it should be. And that's because they're low on iodine. Iodine controls temperature using the thyroid to do it. And how inexpensive is iodine? $30 a year should suit the bill. And Dr. Brownstein compares women in the United States with women in Japan. Now, in Japan, women do not need to supplement with iodine because they're, u- they're eating so much seaweed and sea fish with every meal. I mean, they have seaweed for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? It's just normal. They get loads of iodine from that. Also, it's a, a fairly thin country, and a lot of them live on the coast. And if you happen to live on the coast, you should be breathing iodine in the air th- through the seaweed, which is putting it off into the air. So people by the coast often have enough iodine. But anybody inland, if you're more than a few miles inland, pretty much everybody's low on it. So the Japanese women, in terms of seaweed, have roughly the equivalent of 12 milligrams of iodine, which would be quite a small amount compared with what a medical doctor would have recommended 150 years ago. The doctors now are not taught milligram doses. They're taught microgram doses. So even if the doctor was smart enough to realize you were low on iodine, he'd probably give you the wrong dose. It wouldn't work, and they'd put you on thyroxine drug for the rest of your life. So the iodine deficiency thing is massive, and it's incredibly important for pregnant women. Now, if a woman is low on iodine, the baby will have a low IQ. If the woman, while pregnant, is absolutely critically low, on iodine, there's a medical term for that that mentally damaged baby, which is called cretinism. Child is born a cretin. So if you want to have intelligent babies, you want to make sure you've got enough iodine. If you don't want to get damaged, let's say you're on the west coast of the United States, if you don't want to get damaged by the radioactive iodine floating over from Fukushima, you need to take a supplement of iodine. Because if your iodine receptors are full, the radioactive iodine has nowhere to go in your body. If you are going swimming in a chlorinated pool, you want to take iodine before you go and iodine afterwards because the chlorine will knock out the iodine in all your sex hormones in every cell of your body, and particularly the thyroid, and it's going to make you stupid. If you're forced to use water with fluoride in it, that's going to knock out the iodine. If you're eating bread with flour improver, and every packet of bread in America has usually got flour improver, that's usually bromine, which knocks out iodine. So we're being assaulted by those three damaging halogens. Chlorine is in loads of drink products, it's in the water, if you're having a shower in it. I mean, chlorine was the poison gas of choice in World War I. Chlorine won Poison Gas of the Year Award four years running, right? <laughs> and we are getting in a shower, breathing in the poison gas that is chlorine and rubbing it into our bodies. You know, what are we thinking? And we're drinking with it, cooking with it. You know, it's insane, brushing our teeth in fluoride. I mean, we've got to stop poisoning ourselves, which is number one. You know, just, just stop it. Side story real quick, Clive, on uh, chlorine. I was writing a screenplay last year sometime. It was set in the 1920s, so right after World War One, It was set during the Prohibition era here in the U.S. And I was researching World War One in conjunction with this, too. And I discovered that the media, during and then after the war, had essentially like rechristened it the Chemists' War, because chemical warfare was so important behind the scenes, you know, between the U.S. and the Germans, that the chemists working on these programs were essentially who they were crediting with victory for this war. And I just thought that was interesting. I never heard that, of course, in the mainstream version of World War I, but behind the scenes, chemistry played an awful big role in that war. That's kind of what you were talking about in terms of chlorine. So you're right. Same thing with the fluoride. These are wartime products that essentially just then get added to our daily lives because they have so much in reserve after these wars are over, and then they just dump them on us. So World War I has never ended. It's continuous, and now I would say they're absolutely killing us with chemical warfare, or trying to, more than ever. I mean, look at what happened in World War One. 
After World War I, there was the Spanish flu, right, so-called, and millions of people died. Well, what did they do? The soldiers came back from World War I with the fabulous stories about the, this new wonder drug called aspirin, right? Wonder drug was very good as a painkiller. And it had this secondary effect that it brought down temperatures. It would bring down a temperature. So after the World War I, they released it to the general public. And everybody thought because it was a painkiller, that this bringing down your temperature thing was also a good move. So people got the flu or whatever, whatever it might be, you know, big detox event. All this snot comes out and they sweat out all the poison, a big detoxification event. And obviously, if you're trying to detoxify, you need temperature, you need high temperatures to get it all out. But they took aspirin and died. And it's always the canaries in the coal mine right? They killed a lot of those canaries with aspirin. Then they started injecting them with vaccines. The big Spanish flu deaths, the millions and millions of people worldwide, they died from the vaccines. They did not die from the flu. Yeah. I read Arthur Furstenberg's The Invisible Rainbow, which I think you probably read too. Brilliant book. And that woke me up to a lot of what we're talking about here in terms of not just history of the Spanish flu epidemic, but also the history of electricity and the role that it plays in our health and wellness. And, or I guess maybe the role it plays also in poisoning us, right? Because that, that is a toxin on some level as well. And we can talk more about that for sure. Um, I want to just wrap up the conversation about the minerals here, though. Selenium, which we didn't really get to there, but that's good for DNA damage. It can help repair DNA. It also helps if people are trying to kick some substance abuse habits. Uh, selenium is incredible. It surprised me how incredible it is. You know, I've used selenium for a long time, but a couple of years back, I discovered that there was a different type of selenium out there. And instead of being in tablets or capsules, it was in an oil. And I started researching it and doing interviews. And I've got an interview on, on still on YouTube, incredibly. Put my name in selenium, you'll find it. And um, it was used in the 70s and 80s. Uh, they were doing experiments in New York to get people off methadone. And they found that this particular type of selenium, which is non-toxic, by the way, was succeeding. So I put it on my website a year and a half ago or something, I'm not quite sure, and started getting super interesting results. For instance, just the other day, I have a club, which is called secrethealthclub.com. And every month we have a Zoom meeting for a few hours. And two people came on and said they wanted to talk about selenium. One of them, he must be in, I don't know, early 20s or something like that. He had been on ADHD medication forever. He takes seven drops of the selenium for three days running comes off the ADHD medication, no ADHD. Then this woman says she did the same thing. Uh, I think she took 10 drops and her alcoholic tendencies ended. Then she said, oh, and by the way, as a side effect, my hair color came back. Now, as you can see, I take selenium and my hair color hasn't come back. <laughs> so I'm not saying it's cure all for that, but I've had all sorts of people come off all sorts of substances. If anybody wants to come off a substance, I would recommend doing several things at once. And they would include vitamin C. You want to start before you do it. Vitamin C, fulvic minerals, iodine, magnesium, vitamin D. And I do on my website an amino acid blend. And the thing is with amino acids, assume it's the right blend. Well, the first time I ever used it was I had this client and I watched out the windows. They got out the car and they could barely walk. I wasn't sure they were going to make it. They can't come in and just got a sofa and they just slump down the sofa like half dead. And this guy's only mid forties. And he explains to me that these days he doesn't really need to eat food as such because drinking four bottles of white wine each day gives him all the calories he needs. <laughs> That's what he said. But he was clearly dying right there on my, on my sofa. Anyway, so I suggest a number of supplements, the ones I've just mentioned, 
but I also mentioned that he should take a month's worth of amino acids every day for a few days. And I've got eight months worth on my shelf. I give, I give him maybe seven months worth. I give, I give him the bottles and I make him take a third of the bottle right there and then it's the morning. Anyway, he goes away. I tell him what to do. And that evening, and at that time he'd taken two doses, he poured himself a glass of wine as normal. Didn't feel like it. Put it down again. Next day he has five meals. And reason we up on the eighth, the eighth day, says I've run out of amino acids. I say, have you drunk in the meantime? I said, no. Anyway, my resupply hadn't arrived. He goes back on the booze again and repeats this cycle four times until he's off the booze and then he realizes he's just got to take a tiny amount of amino acids every day. You know, the whole bottle routine was a massive amount. And now I don't recommend that much, maybe a third of that per day. But it's incredible that you can get off substances if you want to. I mean, maybe the products will work whether you want to get off them or not. But it obviously helps if you've made the decision that you've, you're fed up, you've had enough, you're ready for the change. But it can be so much easier. You know, about 20 years ago, I got interested in getting heroin addicts off heroin. So I put a lot of research into how to make it not painful or, you know, because you don't have to get delirium tremors if you come off alcohol. You don't have to get horrendous side effects, cold turkey from coming off heroin. So let me explain the selenium part of this. Now, you take a toxin every day, the body like acclimatizes to it and makes antitoxins to help it deal with the heroin every day, every day, alcohol every day, every day. So if somebody goes cold turkey and stops, the body hasn't worked out you've stopped yet and is going to carry on making those antitoxins for a few days. So you feel like shit. However, selenium of the right type of the right amount for two or three days turns off or negates those antitoxins. So suddenly it makes coming off stuff way easier. Fulvic minerals, also a fantastic detoxification agent. Vitamin C, fantastic detoxification agent. Charcoal, not activated, non-activated charcoal. Fantastic to help these people come off because it's just sucking in the toxins. On that note about toxins, I did have a question here, you know, because we do live in a, a highly toxic environment. I wanted to ask you about some of the common poisons that we consume without really knowing it. You know, stuff that you find mostly in food and water. I mentioned sugar earlier. That's obviously a big one. But I think the best thing there is to just try to avoid it. But I'd like to get your take on some other common poisons that we do consume and how we can get rid of them. The first is, I think, the biggest culprit that's not named sugar, and that's glyphosate. It's been sprayed on everything for about 40 years now. What can we do specifically to help our bodies eliminate that? Really, really good news on that one is high-quality fulvic minerals, otherwise known as fulvic and humic, otherwise known as fulvic acid, a high-quality fulvic minerals neutralizes glyphosate, neutralizes it, loads of proof. Also, perhaps even more important, it neutralizes graphene oxide. Yeah, I, I did have a question about that. I was going to save it for the second hour. But since you brought it up, yes, um, that is, I think, a, a large concern for some people these days. You know, one of the biggest concerns out there. And, I mean, how much does it cost to run on full fit minerals? Most people actually charge quite a lot of money on my side. It costs, I think, in dollars, I think maybe no more than $50 for four months' worth. It doesn't get much cheaper than that. Very, very important substance. It does so many things. So, yeah, I agree with you completely that glyphosate is the, the biggest danger that everybody is faced with. They're spraying it in the schoolyards. They're spraying it in the streets. They're spraying it on everything, virtually. It crosses the mother's milk, you know, the breast barrier. Babies have got it. It's everywhere. But fulvic minerals, yeah, super simple. Fulvic minerals, I know, are, are soil-based minerals. And I've seen an increase in what people call soil-based probiotics the last few years. Is this the same thing? No, no, no. Two different things. But, you know, in the old days, when we were living a more natural life, 
we would be foraging in, in the woods as we do, and we'd know the forest intimately. We'd know when the blueberries were ripe and where they were, when the strawberries, raspberries, yeah, we'd know where everything was, and we wouldn't be washing it. We'd be picking it off the ground. It would have probiotics literally on there. It would have a bit of dirt on it, which, you know, soil-based probiotics, just dirt, really. And fulvic minerals are, are in all dirt everywhere. But the healthy bacteria that we'd be getting, those natural soil-based probiotics, they're fed by the fulvic minerals because they're soil-based. So if somebody is just eating a regular diet that hasn't got a bit of mud in it, so to speak, hasn't got any soil in it, and maybe they're eating, getting a multi-mineral, but most multi-minerals don't have the trace elements that are in fulvic. You know, soil-based, everything that's ever lived or died is in the soil. All life that was above is now below. So there are deposits around the world that are so rich in the minerals that you know, those minerals are missing from food. These trace elements that are in fulvic minerals just are missing in total from everybody's diet, pretty much. So, I mean, I'm not sensitive to, the, to most of the stuff. Yes, I, I know when I take magnesium, but most of the other stuff, I don't notice anything. With fulvic minerals, I notice, and lots of people do, suddenly they feel better because they've got the missing ingredients. They might have been missing for decades. Maybe it's putting the trace minerals in. Maybe it's because it, it's detoxifying your cells. It works at a cellular level. It allows the cells to expand, to uh, change their alkalinity, to exchange toxins for minerals. Gut is everything. We should talk, uh, you know, in the second hour maybe about the gut and how to fix it because everybody more or less has got a damaged gut. Yeah. And another thing about glyphosate, I mean, obviously that does destroy the gut too, but its chemical structure is that it acts in the body in the same way as glycine does, which is an amino acid, which you referenced earlier. And so the body will use, as far as I know, will use glyphosate in place of glycine to do the same job that glycine is intended to do, which glycine creates collagen, helps regulate the nervous system. So if you have this synthetic chemical, this poison doing this in place of an endogenous amino acid, it's no wonder why there are so many nervous systems out of whack these days. Well, and not only that, the method of action of glyphosate in the soil is to stop the plants uptaking minerals. So all the, all the weeds die that aren't genetically modified to take the Roundup glyphosate. But even the plants themselves that are glyphosate ready still are very low on minerals because the glyphosate has knocked it out. So most of the food we're getting is just straight empty. Uh, look at the wheat harvest. When I was young, They'd harvest the wheat, and then they'd burn the stubble to the ground. Then in England, in Europe, I presume in America, they've stopped the burning, made it illegal. So what they now do is they harvest the grains, then they take all the stubble, take it away somewhere, and they're stripping the minerals out with every harvest. So the wheat now is empty because they haven't been burning and putting the minerals back again. It's a disaster. Yeah. I mentioned that uptake process that glyphosate is blocking, and I wanted to ask you about organic sulfur, what you call MSM, because that to me is maybe the primary mineral from the soil that's getting blocked by this uptake process. Plants, vegetables, crops back in the day, like you said, they would be chock full of sulfur, but these modern agricultural practices have depleted sulfur content from the soil, so we don't get much of it from food anymore. Uh, there are some other non-plant you know, plant sources of it. You know, I think eggs are pretty high in it, but you know, why is sulfur so critical to our health? What role does that play in the body? Well, the foods that are rich in sulfur are eggs, cruciferous vegetables, ginger, onion, garlic. And yes, we're all low on it pretty much. Let me tell you a result I had a, a month or so ago. I had this 20-year-old um, autistic man, 20 stone, nonverbal, and if he wants something from the fridge, there's no way you're going to stop him. So give him organic MSM sulfur, which is an extract from the tree processing business, the paper making business. So it's organic in that sense. And they give it to him and he cries for an hour. Apparently, this is very unusual for him to cry for an hour. Then after a little time, for the first time in his life, he says, Mama pretty powerful. And the reason I'd suggested 
that they took MSM was that I felt that he had toxic metal poisoning because he had been injected. And that was how quick it worked. So let's say somebody's got metal poisoning, mercury poisoning, aluminum poisoning. Now, in chemistry, if you can sulfate a metal, now it's copper sulfate, mercury sulfate, aluminum sulfate, all the sulfates are water soluble. So you could have an atom of mercury in your body that's rubbed off from metal fillings or from a tuna fish or something. One atom of mercury will kill the first human cell it comes to. It will not be depleted by this action of killing a cell. It'll carry on killing cells for whatever, thousands of years. And it's not going to get out unless you've got enough sulfur in your body. If you've got enough sulfur in your body, then you can sulfate the metal and pee it out. So that's one of the benefits of sulfur. Another one is as a, a tumour remedy. If I use the word cancer or cure, I'm spelling those words with a K for legal reasons. And so how I first got into the whole sulfur thing was I'd had sulfur on my website for ages, MSM, and nobody ever particularly said to me, wow, that was great. Then I found uh, a guy called Patrick McGeehan, and I started buying his sulfur. And there's, there's again, still on YouTube a video of me uh, interviewing Patrick McGeehan. And the moment we put it on the website, people started phoning up and saying, this is great, this stuff, I feel marvellous on it. And some people, it's like, it's just fantastic. They've got energy and all, all sorts of things. Uh, it can be great for arthritis, great for cancer with a K. Uh, many, many uses, one of the good ones, you know, by the way, there are different qualities of MSM. Super important to get a really good quality one. But one of the big things is that it dissolves scar tissue. Now, when we die at the end of life, there's one school of thought that says we either die from an itis or an osis, like multiple sclerosis or fibrosis, which is scar tissue. Osis means scar tissue. High quality sulfur dissolves scar tissue so you can repair yourself with good tissue, so, which is huge. You think of those of women get all sorts of osis issues. You know. It's a mega thing, uh, sulfur. So here's a fun little tangent or side story that I've not told anybody because, you know, never came up, I guess. But you mentioned Patrick McGeehan. I actually interviewed him too. He's one of the first interviews I ever did for the podcast here. Um, this was back in maybe 2016-ish. And I was still learning how to do phone interviews. Like, because he, he didn't have Skype. He didn't have, I don't even know if Zoom was around back then. But so I was trying to record via Skype to phone and it, the quality just turned out awful. So I couldn't salvage anything from it. And I was really, really, really disappointed. So it's kind of a lost episode of the show here. But he had some great information on sulfur. And, you know, we talked for 90 minutes or two hours about it. And he has a great story about how he came to that. So is that interview on your, your Secret Health Club? Yeah, it, it's on there and on YouTube as well. He was one of the most difficult interviews I ever did. I must have interviewed him in about 2013 or something. I would agree with that, by the way. I had a very difficult time with him, but go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the mo one of the most difficult people to interview. After that first interview, I actually interviewed him twice more, and he was so stoned, I couldn't get a straight answer out of him. <laughs> he was out of his brain. Yeah. And he kept on saying, nobody's ever died while taking sulfur. As Patrick, people die. Even if they're taking your sulfur, people die. And... Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, crazy. Time, but... Yeah, so let's wrap up this part of the chat here with just a couple questions, and then we can get into some some other things in the second hour. But you know, we're talking about vitamins, minerals, supplementation. You know, all the stuff we're speaking of. We'd like to get it from food if we can, but it's hard to get as much as we need from food because it is so depleted. So that's why we're talking about some of the key things that we can supplement here with. But I'm curious what your take is on animal sources versus plant sources and the bioavailability difference between them. I've always thought it's best to get as much of this from animal products as possible because the nutrients are more bioavailable, as I understand it. Do you have any horse in this race? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if somebody is strong, 
fit but wants to detox, then a vegan or raw vegan diet for a month or so might be a really good thing. If somebody's really weak and need building up, I would recommend high quality protein from animals. But of course, an animal needs to be reared properly. It needs to be a not some genetically altered nightmare, but an old fashioned healthy animal fed real, you know, pasture, wild. A cow would eat wildflowers, leaves off the tree, herbs, mushrooms, not just grass, you know, a diet of grass would be like you eating broccoli for the rest of your life, you know. Most animals in America are starving to death and fed genetically modified soya at the end of the day, most of them. So I believe we're omnivores or maybe opportunivores where if we have the opportunity, we'll probably eat it. There are the various diets. There's the Hillary Clinton diet. You know, she, she claims she's a humanitarian, like some people claim they're a vegetarian. Yes, she eats humans. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think she's ate quite a bit of them, actually, just from the looks of her. So you can find supplements in powder form. You can find them in capsules. You can find them in liquids. I think if you know someone who knows someone, you can also get them intravenously. But what say you about the best way to actually supplement when it comes to powders versus capsules versus liquids? Are certain substances consumed better in certain ways, or is there a blanket approach to this? Well, there's personal preference. I mean, I find it really difficult to swallow tablets, but I find capsules go down really easily. So I, I don't do tablets if I can possibly help it. Some things I do in liquid form. I mean, if, if somebody came to me and they had an aching shoulder, I might get some liquid magnesium and r tell them to rub, you know, rub that in every half an hour and see if in a short time later today the, the pain dissipates or goes away completely. I like things like MSM sulfur uh, in powder form, amino acids in powder form, vitamin C in powder form, because... As pure 100% powder, well, it's pure and 100%. If you don't take a particularly large dose of something, you don't want any binders or fillers or flavorings or any nasty stuff. So, you know, that, those are my, my preferences. And on my side, I've got various choices of different ways, you know, and different versions of stuff. You know, if you're going to do a very high dose of vitamin C, for instance, you probably want to use the sodium ascorbate, which is like the tummy-friendly version, if you're going to do a high dose. Whereas, personally, I use ascorbic acid because I'm not doing high doses, I'm just doing a maintenance dose, and I think it tastes much nicer. You know, so there are times and places for each version. And, you know, I've made a, a, a video called something like uh, Supplements, What to Take, How Much to Take, and When to Take Them. Which, which is not on YouTube, but it's almost everywhere else. Brand YouTube, for instance. That's a great video, great resource, because I feel like that is a common question is, you know, people just want to know, okay, how much do I need? When do I take it? Because I think timing of these things is also kind of an overlooked and underappreciated part of supplementation is, is people don't know that, you know, it's better to take certain things in the morning, better to take certain things in the middle of the day, better to take certain things right before bed. And it's just very confusing because your, your body needs different things at different times, right? Well, yeah, yeah, there's an optimum time for everything. And we could talk about that uh, in the second half as well, if you want. For sure. So, Clive, you know, first of all, thank you so much again for taking as much time as you did here today. I really appreciate it. You're a wealth of knowledge and information. Before we wrap the chat, please do tell people where they can find you and your work. Yeah, so my website is my name, clivedecarl.com. Then I have secrethealthclub.com. And... If anybody is interested in these Tesla devices, you can write to me, and the email is tesla at clivedecar.com. And what I'm interested in primarily is finding people who perhaps want a new career or want to use it on as many people as possible because the, the results are so extraordinary. I was in Mexico a couple of years ago when this COVID shit kicked off, and I realized that if I was stuck in Mexico and my bank card wouldn't work, I had one of these machines with me, so I knew I'd always be fine because there's always somebody around the corner in pain, you know. And, uh, you know, so I think 
increasingly, particularly if for the unvaccinated, they no longer have access to health in the, the normal way, that the ability to turn pain off is very valuable. And obviously, these machines, machines do way more than just pain, but pain is what it's best at, getting people out of pain. It's just ludicrous, absolutely incredible results. So people are welcome to write to me, and I'll happily send them more details. For sure. Yeah, I am one of those people that is interested in that because I would like to start working on starting, I guess, a, a private health membership club where maybe something like a piece of Tesla technology could find its way in there and, you know, help treat a lot of people. So, yeah, Clive, you know, like, again, you know, I really do appreciate it. It's a busy time of year for everybody. Very grateful for your time. Well, thank you very much for having me. Very kind of you, Ryan. And as I was saying uh, earlier on to you privately, I've just been listening to your um, latest video and I'm going to carry on listening to some more. So thank you very much for everything you're doing. Well, thank you so much for doing that, because I don't know if a lot of guests actually do that. I would think they would want to know who they're talking to and, you know, I guess, trust them to be able to have a good conversation and, and prompt good questions. So I do appreciate you doing that. Thanks, Ryan. Take care. Bye. And there you have it. My thanks again to Clive DeCarl. The man sure does know how to give an interview. I will say that. Always enjoy listening to him, and I hope you did too. And I hope you found the information presented here to be useful, whether this is the first time or the hundredth time that you've heard Clive speak. You know, I knew that when I rebranded this podcast that Clive was one of the first guys I wanted to talk to, so I was glad we could make it happen as soon as we did into the detox project here. When I first deep dove health and how the body works, I focused almost exclusively on mitochondria and cellular healing, trying to grok just exactly how each cell in my body worked and what it needs to function optimally, what damages cells, how to repair them, and Clive's work was something I came across quite often. And so much love to him and much respect to the community that he's built with the Secret Health Club. It really is quite a valuable resource. And plenty of useful information shared in the second hour of the chat as well, including conversation on supplementation dosage and timing, how to improve eyesight, frequency healing modalities that Clive recommends, Clive's work with Tesla healing technology, speculations on bioresonance and interpersonal frequency alignments, energetic contagions, probably my favorite part of the chat, some thoughts on nanotech removal, how to improve type 1 diabetes, and we wrapped with Clive's thoughts on urine therapy, which is something I've been dabbling in recently. And you can get that extra hour with Clive and the extra hour with all of our guests for $7 a month on the Patreon or the Substack. There's a membership option on Detox.com, also coming soon. I may migrate everyone there eventually because I got to get away from these third-party platforms, especially if we're going to keep talking about the things we're talking about. So please stay tuned for information on that if you're a dedicated listener. I mentioned the private membership association there at the end. Would absolutely welcome donations to help get that started so we can help even more people get healthy and happy. If you want a full breakdown on what that is and what I'm trying to do with that, go back and listen to my outro at the end of the episode with Heather Shepard. I talked for several minutes about the private membership club there. And of course, you can also help me and Mitch the Orgone Donor and our friends bust the geoengineering agenda by going to bustheagenda.com and donating there to help us acquire the materials we need to clear these skies out and reset the natural weather cycle. A lot of irons in the old all-chemical fire for sure, but again, something that benefits everyone here. Building Orgone devices, starting health clubs, even recording a podcast like this. This stuff is not cheap. It's not easy. It's quite laborious, but ultimately it heals and it benefits the collective. I don't care what line your politics or your religious beliefs tow. We have a lot of work we need to do to heal ourselves and our communities and our environment, and you're donating to causes that directly support those endeavors. Links are in the show notes if you're interested. Anything you can give is much appreciated. Anyway, that's the end of my gratuitous marketing plugs, which means it's time for me to grab a pint in the pub and tell some Christmas ghost stories with my friends and that older English gentleman across the way there. So until next time, you know what to do. Love yourself. Think for yourself and reclaim authority. <laughs>